heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 211, covering the week of March 30th through April 3rd, 2020. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook, Exploring the Southern Tradition. It's a great new ebook. And if you've already gotten the old ebook and you want the new ebook, just go and subscribe again. Now, there's a little lag right now. You're going to get our Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday if you sign up for the email. But there is a little lag. We're doing a conversion, so you may not get it right away. But rest assured, the articles are still going up every day, Monday through Friday. Just check the website or go to our Facebook page, and you can see the articles daily as we post them there. If you do like what we do, please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Abbeville Institute. It does support the podcast, the website, conferences, everything that we do, you help support. We also have our shop tab. If you click on that support tab on our webpage, you can find where you can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. You also have that shop tab. Click on that. You get our Abbeville Institute apparel, which is embroidered, high-quality stuff. So you can market the Institute while you're out and about. Well, maybe if you're just quarantined at home, you can get on a webcam or something and do it. Or you can just be comfortable in your home while you're waiting for the coronavirus to move through your area. And speaking of coronavirus, I do have a very um, disappointing thing to announce. We have canceled our summer school for 2020. Um, It just was too much of a risk to take. Uh, We don't know what the situation is going to be in in June of 2020, so we've decided to cancel the summer school for this year. We will have it next year, God willing. Hopefully all this stuff moves through and everything's okay. But the summer school has been canceled, so... Uh, We will not have a summer school for 2020. Uh, Also, again, uh, you can download our free mobile app. Just things you can do. Download our free mobile app. That is also supported by your contribution to the Institute. You can get the uh, Abbeville Institute on the go, get all of our lectures, all of our podcasts. So just go to your app store on your mobile device. Look for Abbeville Institute. You can download that application. Um, And again, share our material around. Rate this podcast wherever you get podcasts. It's a great way to help spread the message and keep people engaged with the Abbeville Institute. Okay, let's talk about the week that was at the Institute. We had some really good pieces this week. I think the first three of the week were just fantastic. The last two were really good as well. I don't think we ever published anything that's not good in its own way. But the first three really hammer home some important parts of the Southern tradition. The last two work in conjunction with those, I think, to supplement the ideas in them. Namely, the, uh, the piece on Tuesday, which is actually was originally published at uh, Law and Liberty, which is the Liberty Fund website. So I just ran most of it here, and then, of course, you had to click over to that link there so that they had a link back. But Liberty Fund is a very good organization. They have uh, good people there. Um, they allow people like us to write book reviews and do other things. And of course, if you're a scholar, maybe you've been to a Liberty Fund conference before. They're probably not having those now. Can't have those now. Uh, But uh, it's a really interesting situation. You sit in in a room, you get around in a kind of a circle, and you have reading and you go over this. And everyone there is a PhD and they've, or some expert in their field, and they discuss the literature and the topic. They're a lot of fun. So, Um, this piece was published at Law and Liberty. It's by Richard Gamble, who is an affiliated scholar of the Institute. He's also a a professor at Hillsdale College. And um, the subject of the piece is the origin of progressivism. The origin of progressivism. And this is something that I think that most people don't understand. You see, they point to the origins of progressivism in the late 19th century in America and say it just kind of popped up there. I mean, it's Teddy Roosevelt. It's Woodrow Wilson. It's these progressives. But see, the origins of the progressives go go back long before that. And in fact, in America, as Richard Gamble points out, 
The origins of progressivism are really in New England and very much so in the antebellum New England and burnt over district of New York. Because as he shows, I think in this particular piece, and he's reviewing a, an interesting book, um, the title of the book is Progressivism, the Strange History of a Radical Idea. It's published by University of Notre Dame Press. Just came out this year uh, by Bradley C.S. Watson. And I think the interesting thing about this, about this, what, what, what Watson does, of course, what Gamble brings out too, is that you had these German philosophers that were very influential in New England, even with people like... Uh, Uh, Julia Ward Howe, who was the one of the most important abolitionist figures in New England because of her pen. Um, and I, I think that when, when he looks at that and he says, okay, look, here's the German influence here. And th the problem with this is that the Claremont School, which is also the Jaffaites, the neoconservatives in many ways, the South-hating part of American conservatism, has adopted much of this progressive ideology. They just don't even realize it. Um, and I think that this is the major problem with American conservatism. Essentially, what Richard Gamble is doing here is saying, hey, look, wait a second here. You guys, you, you people... You professors on the on the neoconservative right are really just progressives. You've adopted it wholesale and you don't even realize it. And I think that's one of the important parts to understand about American conservatism and where the South fits in America. And this is what Boyd Cathy gets into on the Thursday piece, Never Trumpers Like Joe Biden But Hate the South. It's not that Trump is the answer to anything. He's not. In fact, he's pretty awful on a lot of things. Um, but the people that oppose Trump generally hate the South as well. And they hate the South, as Clyde Wilson pointed out, because the South offers a counterweight. It offers something else that they can't control. At least the Southern tradition doesn't fit within their progressive worldview. You see, the Southern tradition retards progress in many ways, or at least this progressive-ism. It's not that Southerners weren't progressive in the purest sense of the word. They believed in the progress of man. Though man was fallen, you could not have a utopia on this world. They thought that you had to work within the realities of life, but it didn't mean they didn't want to see the advancement of mankind in terms of medicine or comforts or these type of things. They weren't sitting around thinking, you know what we need to do? We just need to live in the woods and run around naked. No, these people were, they understood the progress, so to speak, of civilization. They enjoyed civilization, but they recognized the anchor that tradition provided. And I think that's the important part to understand with this. They understood the anchor that tradition provided. They could work within the world, but they weren't necessarily of the world. Now, Eugene Genovese pointed out in The Slaveholder's Dilemma that certainly there was this, and this is the tug of that, right? You have this, this idea that we need to, to go forward, that there are things that society, modern society brings that we enjoy, but yet we still want to have this pre-industrial, pre-modern society in some ways. So the Southern tradition is not anti-progress, it's anti-progressivism. It's, it's anti the idea of progress, which naturally leads to this notion of perfectibility of man, which is completely hogwash, right? I mean, it's it doesn't make any sense. The perfectibility of man cannot make sense if you are a Christian in any sense of the word the perfectibility of the world around you. It cannot be perfected. It can only be endured in some ways, but of course, enjoyed as well. 
And that's something of note when you look at the piece on Friday by Paul Yarbrough. And I'll get into these in a little more detail, but this entire pandemic is something that Southerners, the Southern tradition, as I wrote last week, uh, can offer a reprieve from, right? I mean, this is, if we already are doing some of these things, if we had already believed in community and family and faith and taking care of your own, and being within and not without, living a little more rural life, if you already do those things, and this is not much of a difference. You see, the Southern tradition offers the counterweight. People are suffering in urban areas. I mean, it's awful in New York City. And of course, the almost the entire United States has been shut down now which is causing all kinds of economic hardship and pain for people. It's awful. It's awful. People are really struggling. They're struggling financially. They're struggling emotionally. They're struggling physically. They're struggling mentally. People are struggling right now. But the Southern tradition, it, with its endurance, you see, Southerners understand they've already been through some of these things before. Look, Infectious disease pandemics have hit the South many times throughout Southern history. The pain of Reconstruction. Now, for most of us who were younger, didn't have anybody. Maybe if you're in your, if you're above seventy, you probably still were able to talk to people in your life, perhaps who had been through at least a part of Reconstruction. So you understand. I mean, these are people that, or at least had an attachment to people who have been through Reconstruction. And so that's a hard story. That's a hard tale to tell. And you understand it, the pain of it. And so with that, you have a different perspective on life. And you're not a progressive in terms of, of the capital P, right? The progressives with the capital P. But the neoconservatives really are. They're progressives with a capital P. There's no difference between George Bush who was a Republican progressive and the progressives of the 19th century used to ask progressives all the time, why don't you love George Bush? He's one of you. He's a progressive. No, no, no. He's not a progressive. He doesn't believe in progressive progressivism. Yes, he does all the time. He's a New England progressive. He is a, a social gospeler without, without a doubt, but he is a New England progressive. And when you look at, let's just go to, Boyd's piece on, Dr. Kathy's piece on Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Thursday, never Trumpers like Joe Biden but hate the South. You look at what he's talking about here and the, and the intolerance that these progressive Republicans have for the South. They hate it. They hate it. They hate the South. They hate Confederate monuments. They hate all these things. And of course, the Trump revolution in some ways, or at least the Trump ripple, it's not really a revolution, the ripple, caused some people to rethink some of these things. And of course, Conservatism Inc. went on a diatribe against the unwashed, the deplorables, all the people that supported Trump who did not fit with their neoconservative worldview, globalism, uh, social justice, conservatism. I mean, it didn't fit with that. So this is where, I mean, look, Joe Biden is bad. Donald Trump, like I said, in many ways is bad. But at least he was sympathetic with the South. There was still a Southern strategy there. He still said, you know, Robert E. Lee's a great general. And look at how he was excoriated for saying Robert E. Lee was a great general. Even the, ne the neoconservatives went ballistic over this. Oh, how can you say that? Because if you look at some of the things, you look at Bone Kemper, or some of these, Bone Kemper, of course, is dead now, but you look at some of the people that have been publishing things. Robert E. Lee is awful. The South is awful. How can you even like the South? Victor Davis Hanson, the South is terrible. The South is just awful. You, you, can't, you can't love it. You can't love Robert E. Lee. So this is what neoconservatives and progressive conservatism, social justice conservatism gives us. And, you know, Gamble teaches at Hillsdale, where there's a lot of these people there, 
but he is a, a different voice at Hillsdale College. And you look at this idea about progressivism, and, and even in the South, how important it was. You look at Jack Trotter's piece on Wednesday, The Strange Career of Segregation. This is a wonderful piece. It was actually our summer school, one of our summer school lectures last year. The Strange Career of Segregation. Great piece. He takes on C. Van Woodward in The Strange Career of Jim Crow, and he sides with, I mean, he, he agrees with Woodward that segregation was born in the North. And though there was some part of it in the South before it was essentially imported from the North, you can't point to anything in the South that wasn't, or you can't point to very many instances in the South that weren't integration-driven. And he gives a lot of examples of that. Look, the South was integrated before the war. Now, not in ways that we would consider integration today, but you look at the manner in which whites and blacks in the South lived and worked next to each other all the time. It was completely integrated. I mean, you look at images that were painted in the South before the war, and you almost always have a black Southerner in the images. Always. Always. Even the image we use for the Abbeville Institute, if you look at our webpage and you look at um, some of the things we put out, of course, our newsletter, our, our emails. We have that image of 1820 South Carolina College. People have asked, what is that? It's 1820 South Carolina College, which is now the University of South Carolina. It's the horseshoe there in South Carolina, the original campus. There is a black South Carolinian in the image walking down the street. You see, because that was life. Uh, one of the films that Clyde Wilson recommended last week for Faulkner, which was Intruders in the Dust, um, it's a film about Mississippi and, of course, a, a potential lynching. It, it's a really great story. It's a Faulkner story. But you look at the imagery of the film, and at the end, here you have this segregated society, because it was when the film was made, 1946, I believe, 46 or 49, I can't remember the exact year. But you look at the society, it's it's segregated, without question, but not every day. You see, at the end of the film, the character who is being accused of murder, who was uh, his lawyer and a young man and a grandmother, an old lady, determined he wasn't guilty, and so he wasn't going to be lynched, and he comes in to... to pay for their ser for the lawyer's services. The lawyer says, uh, you know, forget about it. But here you have the streets of this town in Mississippi full of black Mississippians walking around with white people. I mean, it's just every day. Every, everybody walked around. It just wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, you had this area that was only for black people, this area only for white people. Certainly some things were segregated. There's no doubt about it. But everyday interaction, you had it all the time. You had it in the antebellum south. You had it in the postbellum south. That is not the case with the antebellum north or even the postbellum north. In many places, they wouldn't even see a black American their entire life, or maybe only in images, or maybe one or two. But in the south, this was an everyday occurrence. And so I think Professor Trotter does a fantastic job detailing how this progresses over time, so to speak, you know, the word progress here, how this, how progressivism essentially brought segregation into the South. You look at some of the most ardent segregationists in the South, they were progressives. I mean, it, in, uh, in Alabama, for example, John Patterson, who uh, was elected governor, was governor in 1960, 61, when you had the uh, some of the real problems with uh, violence in the South during the Civil Rights Movement. And you look at uh, his political positions. He styled himself as a Southern John F. Kennedy. He was a progressive. He's an ardent progressive. Even to this day, he's still alive. He's in his 90s now, but he's still a progressive. Uh, he, I mean, he, he loves the South, but he's a progressive. And he was an ardent segregationist. In fact, he was supported by the Klan. Uh, his opponent at one point was George Wallace. George Wallace wasn't as 
hard on the segregation issue. He, he wasn't as interested in it, so he lost. And he said at that point he would never be in a position where somebody else could be a greater segregationist than him. That's not the term he used, but he could never be in, there would never be a greater segregationist than George Wallace in his own mind. It would never happen again. So you look at John Patterson, you look across the South, the progressives were some of the most ardent segregationists out there because that was seen as progressive, you see. And I think Jack Trotter does a nice job in bringing this forward and explaining that these people that are often, oh, we're, these, are, these are progressives. Progressivism is the disease. Richard Gamble points that out. And the disease is born in New England, and it's still around with the social justice conservatives. The Jaffites, the Straussians, the neoconservatives, these people at Claremont Institute, they are still the disease. It's the antithesis of tradition, which I think that Bill Watkins does a tremendous job pointing out in his Monday piece, which is why it was a Monday, but his Monday piece on what Richard Weaver and the strenuous life can offer in this time of COVID-19. He points out the fact that here he is, he works in a in an office, nine to five, but he's got an acre of land that he farms. And he says, this is not the, the complete gateway, but it's an attachment. It's a, it's a grounding in the real world. One of the things that Jefferson advocated for everyone to do was go on a nature walk. Go on a nature walk every day. It's good exercise, number one. And number two, it grounds you in nature. Now, maybe you can't do that. Maybe you live in a city where there aren't any nature walks available. And that's this is why Richard Weaver pointed to cities as being problematic. It's why Thomas Jefferson pointed to cities as being problematic. Because it didn't connect you with the real world. You see, cities are entire creations of man. And you begin to worship the creations of man and not the creations of God. And it's the, the point is being a good steward of these things. People need green space. I've seen countless articles about people needing blue space. It's why people like to be next to water, oceans, lakes, rivers. They need that blue space. They need the sound of the water. It's that draw, that inherent draw that's in all of us to creation. Building a building is creation in its own way. You're creating something. Putting something together is creation, but everyone needs that attachment, that connection to the things that are uh, so important for the development of the soul, which is that connection to the land, being good stewards of the land. Neil Kumar wrote a piece a few weeks back where he talked about this, and he was People were critical of this piece because he talked about, you know, government funding for parks and national parks and these type of things. Which, of course, if you look at it from a purely constitutional standpoint, it's, it's unconstitutional. There's no doubt about it. But it was simply the idea that there had to be a southern-driven environmentalist movement. And what does that mean, a southern-driven environmentalist movement? Well, not a earth-worshipping environmentalist movement, but an environmentalist movement that, like, uh, there's a great uh, private park near where I am. It's called Callaway Gardens, the Callaway family. It's very southern in it because it's a private stewardship of the land. You see, the Callaway family grew up on farms, and they recognized the problems that southern farmers were having in rural Georgia. And so they got interested in scientific agriculture and trying to boost profit and production not wearing out the soil, doing the things that Southerners had done for years. There's actually a, a, a place also in, it's in Lumpkin, Georgia. It's uh, called Providence Canyon. It's called the Little Grand Canyon. It's this beautiful canyon, but it's not so beautiful if you know what caused it. It was erosion. Farmers not understanding what they needed to do to prevent erosion. So now you had this awful erosion, which created this beautiful canyon. It's great scenery, but it's the byproduct of erosion. And uh, so it's, it's sad in that way that that's what caused it. But you have this stewardship of the land, and then they created this beautiful park that you it's private, so you have to pay to go use it, walking trails, nature. The idea is to create this symbiosis with nature and, of course, humanity. And it, you go in, and, you, and, I, and I know I've mentioned on this podcast where you go, and there's a video, and they talk about how 
Callaway Gardens is the example of what private individuals can do. You don't need the conservation ethos, which is Gifford Pinchot of New England, saying that government is the only thing that can protect land, individuals ruin it. No, not in the Southern tradition. The Callaway family was fully steeped in the Southern tradition. These were important people in, in uh, southwestern Georgia. Important people in Georgia. Uh, and they were factory owners at one point, but they viewed that as a way to help people work within this tradition of America. And then they got inv involved in this gardens project. It's just a beautiful place. But it's that balance between modernity and the real world, the environment, that's very important in the Southern tradition, which is, I think, Bill Watkins does a tremendous job pointing that out. That balance between modernity and and tradition. And this Richard Weaver embodies that. I mean, if you haven't ever read Richard Weaver before, you need to. You need to go out and read Richard Weaver. There's, I mean, the, the Southern Tradition at Bay is just a tremendous book. But his collection of essays, um, the Southern Essays of Richard Weaver, you can get it's a Liberty Fund publication. Uh, there's also a collected, uh, a larger volume of his essays from Liberty Fund again uh, that you can get. But you should read Richard, Richard Weaver, who died far too young and too long ago. But uh, one of the great uh, connections between the agrarians of the 1930s and the more modern age. Of course, the agrarians are connecting to the Jeffersonians in many ways. So the Southern tradition has much to say about what we're going through right now. And of course... You know, you look at Paul Yarbrough's piece and very critical of the handling of this problem in Washington, which is giving us $6 trillion in debt, essentially. And the Federal Reserve and the fusion of banking and finance and government and all the problems that causes, which is a very Jeffersonian critique of the entire situation. But this is what we've gotten. You know, we're running the United States now for New York. I mean, essentially, that's what's happened. New York, it's awful. So we're going to run everything like everywhere is New York. It's a, it's a one-size-fits-all progressive, top-down approach to the problems of America. I have seen, though, of course, this revitalization of federalism and <laughs> places saying, you know what? Uh, for example, Delaware is going to pull anyone over that's out of state and say, you either got either to go home or you got to go quarantine for 14 days. We see you around. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to get arrested. I mean, this is wonderful. Well, they should do this all the time. If you're from New York, pull you over. You got to either go home or you got to be quarantined for 14 days to make sure you're not going to bring some type of uh, infectious disease into our state. Uh, maybe they could do this all the time, you know, and just uh, have a situation. I mean, you go down to uh, the Gulf Coast, and uh, I was down there a couple of times last year, and uh, every license plate was from out of state. I mean, from not when I say not just out of state, not just Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana, it was Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, New York, New Jersey. And it, that could just stay at those places. But of course, this is where we have this idea this is all ours. You know, this is all ours. It's just our country. We can go wherever we want. And I mean, there is some freedom to that, but uh, it's not really yours because you don't live there and, and uh, you don't live there full time. And the impact that you have, the economic, they look at it with well, the economic, and we, we provide jobs for you and all this. But the other impact of it, of course, environmental at times, it's social. There's a reason that the Gulf Coast area of Florida right now is getting hit pretty hard from this awful virus because there were so many tourists there or parts of Delaware, for example, where you have the beaches, it's getting hit hard by the virus right now because there were so many tourists there. They all came down and brought the virus with them from New York and New Jersey, which is where they get a lot of tourists from in that part of the state. So perhaps something we can get out of this is a much more reflective view of life, uh, trying to get in touch with nature, maybe be good stewards of these things, get outside, put your feet in the grass, enjoy the birds, enjoy the trees, Enjoy this life, the beautiful things, the bounty. And this is what Virginians often said about the world 
in the early 17th century when they arrived, the bounty that was here, enjoy that bounty. Whereas New Englanders look at it with, you know, just a dark, foreboding place we have to tolerate. Enjoy the bounty that's there that's creation has provided and work within that. That's the Southern tradition. That's the response to this. And try to take care of you and your own and do the best you can. And of course, we're going to continue doing this. The website, hopefully that's offering a reprieve for you. Maybe a, a little escape from the drudgery of being homebound or being locked in, quarantined, or whatever else is afflicting you at this point. But it's free of charge. The website's free of charge. All of that, so much of that is free of charge. Go out there and enjoy it. And enjoy, if you can, enjoy a little bit of nature during this time period. Until next time, good day. <laughs>